every single biological expedition to Western Pablo comes up with like 15 new species. And I don't mean gray squirrel that's different from the other gray squirrel. I mean like, here's a deer we didn't know existed. Here's a type of dog that we'd never seen before. I mean, there's like some big stuff there. Yeah. So they so that's scientists have declared that extinct, but you think that's still what what evidence like are you going off of that makes you think it's still out there? That one again, going back to my earlier point, it's gut feeling is one, but that gut feeling is a derivative of there's a ton of habitat. Mm -hmm. It's in an area that doesn't have a lot of Western science, you know, because when we say something's extinct, that's just us. That's just the right. Western yeah, world. Right. You know, they don't guys there that are killing and eating pink headed ducks, they're just like, that's that's just food. Yeah. Like that's not a special thing. <laughs> um <laughs> and then there have been a lot of sightings reported, you know, people that have come through the woodworks, because you know, this is what my team does. Like we dig into this data, but people that have come through the woodwork and gone, like, yeah, I saw one of those when I was a teenager or, you know, Two years ago, I was sitting out in a canoe and one of those ducks flew by and I could, you know, it had a bright pink head and a brown body. It's like, there's not a lot of other things. So if you look at all the factors, like where is it? How much science is going on there? Like you said, nobody's going to Myanmar right now. Um, what is the habitat? Is there sufficient prey source? All those kind of things. And are there sightings? It checks a lot of the boxes. Mm. Now, are you... The book you said you're writing right now, we, we talked about that a couple hours ago. That was yeah. the one involving the how they do science, right? Yeah, I mean, like it's, it, science. it's not really like um, belittling how science is currently done. Yeah. It's more celebrating like renegade scientists, right. like people that break the mold and usually have a ton of naysayers and people say like, you're crazy and like, you shouldn't do that. And then come out the other end of it, like rewriting natural history. Yeah. The reason I bring it up is because it's like, how many times do you think you're gonna have to do something like this? Especially as a guy who's now been a very clear public figure for a long time. You're respected by a lot of people who, whose voice very much should matter on the issue around the world. Like, how many times are you gonna have to find something before some of these fucking snobbed up people are like, <laughs> you know what, maybe he's not wrong about everything. Well, I think the problem is that I'm a public figure. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and it's not everybody, right? Like, I, yeah, yeah. I think the majority, like, I I think, and I don't know because I don't weigh myself against other public figures, but I think that we, I have a astoundingly positive, like, people like what I do a lot. I agree. Yeah. You're a likable guy. Yeah, yeah. well, that's <laughs> lucky for that. But <laughs> I, I don't, I don't think it'll ever go away. Like, you know, I'm sure you have haters too. Like, everybody that's in the public light, everybody that's on social media or YouTube they find these people come out of the cracks that are just like, I hate them. And you're like, <laughs> I don't even know who you are. And I don't know why you hate me, but congrats, I guess, you know? Yeah. And I don't think I have very many of them, but whoever, they're definitely out there. I see the comments on YouTube and stuff like that here and there. Yeah, you're, listen, you're always going to have those where I worry about it more for a guy like you who's an expert in a field and literally a scientist is like when people who have not a fucking YouTube commenter, but yeah. actual people who have pulled to do something about it, like yeah. in spaces like this or shutting you down because they're like, oh, well, he does YouTube or whatever. Well, fuck you. I mean, we talked about this earlier. But, yeah. you know, like how the fuck else are you supposed to educate people these days and, and get the word out and get kids excited about this stuff? I would say I don't actually get that, which is lucky. I Like if I reach out to a government or an organization or something and want to work with them, they're all, they're usually like, oh yes like that would be awesome like we love what you do or i've seen what you do or let me look it up and yeah like i'd love you to bring exposure to what we're doing the pushback i don't i don't get a lot of like professional i did in the early days in the early days of like hey i'm gonna go look for an extinct leopard they're like okay tinfoil hat guy <laughs> you know they're like you're a lunatic like have fun buddy but now after proving myself as you've said a few times i feel like most of the time like when my team reaches out to someone and is like, hey, we'd love to come and you know work on your elephant project or film at Ventara or whatever it happens to be. They're like, yeah, that'd be great. That's awesome. Yeah, That's so really lucky in that regard. Yeah. yeah. Who, who inspires you the most, like in the conservation space? Even stuff gr from growing up, people you may have never had a chance to meet. Um, it's a good question. I mean, my biggest inspiration was my grandfather and he was a shopkeep in Harare. He wasn't exactly like a world-renowned conservationist, but... He was just someone who understood the bush, would spend a lot of time out in the bush, walk with elephants, learn, listen. Um, not like me, he didn't just yammer all the time, he actually listened. And uh, that was always a big inspiration to me. But there are other people, like unsung heroes, again, what this book is about. Um, David Ebert, he basically, he's, I don't even know if he'll come up on Google, but his name's Dave Ebert, and you might wanna type in sharks. He's basically the godfather of shark conservation. 
When Jaws and all these other things started, yeah, there you go. That's that, that guy, I love that guy, man. The lost shark guy, Dave Ebert, such an unsung hero, works in his little office, you know, and I, I'm not trying to be belittling, at, at San Jose State in his, in his tiny little crammed office. And this guy's named more shark species than anyone else on the planet. He's basically the godfather of shark conservation. Wow. Ivan Carter, someone I've known since I was a little kid, most people don't know his name. He was like a world-renowned trophy hunter who one day, I feel like he shot his last elephant and was like, well, I'm never doing that again. It like broke his heart and he changed his mind. Wow, And I don't that's care. Cool. Like, I don't, like, do I, I, obviously I don't support that he used to kill all these yeah, things. Yeah, you gotta win people over. But so, he, yeah. he did it himself. He literally just went, nope, not killing anything anymore. And now he's like the most outspoken, astounding conservationist. And the list like this goes on and on and on. Um, and, and, you know, so I take inspiration, I take inspiration from Ben Lamb. Yeah. Ben is not a conservationist. I'm sorry. Like he is now by default, but he's a businessman, as you said earlier. He's a billionaire. Yeah. <laughs> he's a businessman. But like I find the fact that he came in having truly no real interest in wildlife or conservation or anything as like a foundation and now going, yeah, 50 million to save to fix EHV. Let's do it. Yeah. That, I find that inspirational. You I know? do. I do. And that's the thing. Like, that's what I was really trying to get a read on when he was yeah. here. I'm like, is he just a business guy? But uh, he is, but, but he is, but yeah. I, I, you, you feel like he's, he's really actually into it. His job yeah. is to go make money for the company. Don't get me wrong. Like yeah. that, that, that is the job. Yeah. But like, this is a guy who's having fun at the Explorers Club light. And you can see when people light up when you talk totally. about things. Totally. Now, Matt will light up on every fucking thing ever. Well, he loves he's animals. lived in it his yeah. whole life. Yeah. But then you'll see those, those, some of those topics you get to with Ben and he's like, oh, bro, let me, yeah. let me tell he you about out. this. Yeah, he yeah. freaks out. And it's like, all right, that's cool. Like, you need people like that. You need people who are fans that, that actually like can do something about it too. Yeah. You know what I mean? Oh yeah. Dude, Anat Ambani, the billionaire Indian guy, you want to talk billionaires, yeah. like he's on another level of wealth. I will sit at dinner with him and we'll be talking and it's like I'm talking with, a, it's like I'm eight and he's eight and we're little yeah. kids. Yeah. And I'm like, did you see this one crocodile that has this? I remember I was sitting there and I was talking about okapis with him, which is like a okapis. horse zebra looking animal. It's actually in that video too, but you can just Google it. Um, it's like this, this Congo zebra horse giraffe looking animal, O-K-A-P-I. Um, and I'm talking yeah, to him. This one wrong. Um, oh, copy. That's it. Yeah. Okay, let me that <laughs> You're good. That animal. Beautiful creature. What the fuck? They're unbelievable. Super shy. This super isn't elusive. extinct? No. Go Actually, go back to that YouTube video I was, I was in and uh, just scrub forward and you'll see me playing with one, oh, um, okay. which is a very rare thing to do. But uh, anyway. I've never heard of this in my life. Aren't they crazy? Okay. Galante. What did we type in for that? It's again? right there. Bottom right. Oh, I already got it up. Um, okay. I mean, I don't want to take up your time watching YouTube videos. No, 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 videos, this is great. This if you, is, if you just like here. go through that search bar, somewhere in there is me feeding, hand feeding one, which is, you see how big they are next to me. Keep going, keep going. Um, but a knot, my point is like, I was sitting at dinner with him one time talking. I go, oh, you know that uh, albino a copy? And he goes, Forrest, it's leucistic. And I'm just like, you're there such a dork. You know, he's just, yeah, there it is. Just like me. And I find that inspirational. This guy spends hundreds of millions of dollars saving animals with no return. This isn't open to the public. No one can go there. This is just for him to save animals. That's so cool. Yeah, I love that stuff too. I find that inspirational. And then you've got this incredible creature. Look Are at it. Are they endangered at all? Like, um, you'd have to check their conservation status. They were at one point in time put on the endangered species list. That I've... looks like a fucking unicorn. Isn't it? Isn't that crazy? <laughs> So this, they're really interesting. They had um, mythological status. Mythological. So to the point that when people, when Western, like I think it was Dutch scientists first went to the Congo, people would tell them about all these animals. They'd tell them about Moko Lembe, Moko, whatever that thing yep, was, yep, the, yep. the dinosaur we looked at, and gorillas and all of this. And they're like, okay, yeah, maybe. And then they like, found gorillas. They're like, holy shit, gorillas are real. And then they found, you know, whatever, the snake. And they're like, oh, that's real. And then there was like, Oh, but there's also this animal, this okapi out there that has the stripes of a zebra and the body of a giraffe and the face of a horse. And they're like, okay, you're full of shit. <laughs> like, you know, that's mythological. And then one day, sure enough, some dust, Dutch scientists found them and they're like, oh, wow, this wasn't a rumor. This is a real one. That's yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, but they were considered a mythological animal for a long time. What I, I don't expect you to know this off the top of your head, but what like ballpark... I can probably Google this after I ask it, but what ballpark percentage of species do we not even know about? Meaning not even ones that we knew and are declared extinct, but it's just like 
we can estimate that X percent of the earth, we don't even know this percent that actually exists. It's such a boring way to answer this question. But the thing is, speciation has become such a weird field of science. Like now, if you want to make your mark as a scientist, uh -huh. you go and look at like, okay, there's squirrels here and there's, there's squirrels on the left side of the mountain and there's squirrels on the right side of the mountain. They look identical, but there's a mountain range between them. If we catch both squirrels and test them, can we actually show that they're different species? So you or I might be like gray squirrel, gray squirrel, but speciation in the sciences has become a way to like make your mark. Semantics. So, semantics. And they're dividing so many species up. So if you try to take that out of the question, because I just didn't want to give a blank, blanket answer and just be like, how many animals are there like okapi still roaming around that we don't know about? I think it's like above the water because the ocean's different above the water it's like less than one percent we've found most okay. of the big animals like we know most of the big things but there are still so many like every single biological expedition to papua new guinea western papua comes up with like 15 new species and i don't mean gray squirrel that's different from the other gray squirrel i mean like here's a deer we didn't know existed here's a type of dog that we'd never seen before i mean there's like some big stuff there but for the most part, humans have spread so far right. around this planet. I mean, you know what it was like staying with Paul, and he probably knows all the animals, right? Yeah, and that's the thing. Like the Amazon, I could see with your logic there how that's more of an outlier because it's it's this actual one big congested of wildlife, just fucking untapped area because it's almost the size. It's like 85% the size of the continental United States or exactly, something. Yeah. So, yeah, when – human beings being able to go that deep into there where there's uncontacted tribes and shit isn't fully possible, whereas other places are more reachable That's around right. the world. It's a smaller actual distance to cover. So maybe if you go to like Sri Lanka and some of their, I think, rainforests and stuff there, like, I hope I'm getting like Indonesia or Sri Lanka, like it's smaller, so it's more accessible to get everywhere and thus right. find the Yeah, species. and there's islands that you can try. But yeah. still, I mean, there are undeniably big animals that we haven't yeah. described yet, but there's not like... It's not like 10% or something like that. It's a small amount. Isn't it crazy, though, how we've only explored like 5% of the ocean? Yeah. Tops? Yeah, it's crazy. And there's there's a lot of speed. I mean, until, think about this, until I want to say 15 years ago now, and that number is probably wrong, we thought that the foundation of life, all life in the universe required sunlight. The foundation of our food mm. chain was photosynthesis, and it came from sunlight. Right. Then all of a sudden we put an ROV or a submarine down in the bottom of the ocean. They're like, wait a minute, there's hydrothermal <laughs> vents here and there's entire ecosystems of creatures, literally entire complex food webs that have never had a single thing to do with sunlight, that have evolved independently of sunlight. Like, oh, huh, maybe we should we rethink cross off life. That science. Yeah, it's like we literally have to rethink how life works because we found that life can exist on hydrothermal energy, it has nothing to do with solar energy. Yeah. It's crazy. That was like 15 years ago. It's not like, you know, know when Charles know. Darwin was cruising right. around. It was like, oh, wait a minute. We we are 100% sure as science that all life requires sunlight. Oh, no. No, we don't. <laughs> and then you look at how they map what sums of uh, some of the bottom of the ocean could look like and everything. It's mountain ranges and valleys just like we have here. It's exactly. just covered by water. Exactly. And it's yeah. like, what is even in those crevices? You have no, no idea. idea man. No idea. Yeah. Fucking crazy, man. Giant and, squids and all kinds of stuff down there that we don't know about still. Also, though, have you followed this whole thing that's going on with, like, Paul Watson with the with the arrest and finally they let him out and all that? I'd love the Sparknotes version. I know he did something. He got arrested for, like, a year, right? And then yeah. he, got, he got released, and now he's back on the boats creating conflict again. A, a that part, I got to see how much he's actually doing but okay. yeah he's this is the guy who essentially like saved some of our whale species he's the whale war whale wars guy like yeah. walk the talk with this whole thing and i guess because of that he was like wanted in japan or something where they have some interesting practices when it comes to sea wildlife mm -hmm. and so maybe it was the dutch please correct me in the comments if i'm misremembering all this but it was the dutch who like arrested him and were holding him on like an interpol warrant or something like something that. something like that yeah to get him back but now they they got him out and all that but it it, it kind of disappointed me because it's like you literally have one of the true and blue clearest like legit made a mark on the earth conservationists of yeah. the last century 
And what kind of message are we sending when the guy has to, like, fight internationally for freedom to not be arrested and sent to jail for trying to protect some of these creatures and whatever? You know, it that is where it gets weird. And you remember you got a bunch of different, totally different incentives around right. governments around the world. And yet we're all a part of the same populace where, you know, if we care a lot, for example, about the climate here in America, who's to say fucking China does? Exactly. It gets so exactly. weird out there. And that's a little bit disheartening when I see that. Our, we also get this, um, because we do live in the United States, and we get this sort of complacency about like, that's what's important. Those are the laws you know, that would never happen. And then you go to any of these places we've talked about today, and it's like, their laws are completely different. Yes. Their incentive is economic. Like, yeah. they're still developing nations. They don't care if you're a good at heart trying to save whales. If you slow down their economic development, which can be a whaling ship, they're going to kill you. And yep. they'll either kill you by putting you in prison for the rest of your life or execute you or anything else. And like, you know, here we're like, that would never happen. Like, he's a hero to the whales. It's like, yeah, but not that's not in Japan, not in China, not mm -hmm. in wherever, you know, not in Denmark or Norway or whatever it happens to be. Like, they all, it's completely different. Yeah. Thank you guys for checking out this clip. If you haven't already subscribed, please subscribe and hit the like button on this video. It is a huge, huge help. And if you'd like to check out this clip's full podcast episode, that link is in the description below or right here. And finally, you can follow me on Instagram and X by using the links in my description below.